People came to my talk. It's cool. <laughs> All right. Cool. So hi, guys. My name is Andrew Silver, uh, and I lead the illustration team over at Riot Games. Yeah! <laughs> What's up, Pete? Um, one of the things that we do over at Riot Games is a thing that we call splash art, which is, in short, the illustrations of our champions and skins in League of Legends. We spent a lot of years working on developing this team that we feel like offers a lot of benefit to help players deepen their understanding of the League of Legends IP. Over time, we paid particular attention to leveling up our painting ability, bringing on new people, training the ones we had, and developing the style we wanted our art to live in. But I'd argue that the team's biggest level up throughout the years was actually in something a bit outside the realm of craft. There we go. Just as a heads up before we jump into this, uh, I wanted to point out that the work featured here is actually the result of all of these guys. Uh, we have a mentality on the team that every splash comes from every individual on the team. So a bit of context around our game real quick. League of Legends is a massive multiplayer online battle arena for hardcore gamers. So what the hell does that even mean? Uh, two teams of five set out to kill enemy champions and minions, mow down defensive towers, and ultimately destroy the enemy's base. Now after this, they jump into a new session and try to do it all over again. It feels like 5v5 chess, where each one of the pieces is a fighting game character, and had that have many of their own unique abilities. Splash Art is essentially the player's first experience with that champion. Now, taking a look back at how we used to think about splashes, Splash Art started back in our super freaking humble beginnings with this incredibly derpy version of Sion. <laughs> now, these were meant to serve the primary purpose of being a character select screen, similar to those of the classic fighting games of the 90s. They were meant to show players exactly what champion or skin they were about to unlock or play. Now, very quickly, we realized that Splash Art really determined whether a player was going to pick up and play this champion. So because of this, we developed a certain subset of rules in order to maximize Splash's impact on a champion's performance and create a cohesive feel for League of Legends Splash Art. So today, I don't want to give you guys a tutorial on how to paint. What I'd rather do is show how our old way of thinking was extremely limiting to our champion's emotional impact on players, and the League community recognized it. Check out this evolution. Hey, not so derpy splat, Sion. Uh, I want to talk about how we evolved our philosophy behind why we create Splash Art and share some of the lessons that we learned along the way in our pursuit to make art that really resonates with players. As a team, we had to understand exactly how players experience Splash Art. So let's walk through what a player sees when they log into the game. Let's say you're a Jinx player. Uh, you start at the login screen, which generally features one of the newest animated splashes. Uh, you check out the champion details page where you could see your splash and maybe read up on the champion. Uh, when you click play, you'll see the champion select screen where you pick your champion. Uh, and then you load into the game while checking out what the two teams consist of. And finally, you're in game. Now, for a long time, this is what we used to think of as a champion. Uh, the in-game model. And for a lot of our content, including our splash art, we aim to best represent the model as the identity for the champion. Now, over time, we started to realize, well, yes, you know, the model is an important part of, of a player's perception of who this champion is. Uh, the real perception of a champion is comprised of an amalgamation of all the content that we create. Things like illustration, 3D model, music, music videos, promotional teasers, web experiences, toys, and so on. You know, all of these things give a clear understanding of who a champion is. But over time, our mentality evolved even further. This character doesn't really exist in the real world. Players can't go to a real place and meet Jinx. The way that we're starting to think is that a true champion ultimately lives in players' minds. Our job as game developers is to do our best to accurately represent the character we want players to see in their imagination. We can only influence our players' perceptions of who a champion is. And we have to do this well with every piece of content that we create for champions. Uh, when the illustration team realized this, we set out a new goal. Use Splash to tell strong, fantasy-driven stories for players and create windows into the League of Legends IP. The team saw Splash not as a way of just show showing champions doing cool things, 
but to show their personalities and give players an identity to relate to. I love this. Uh, if you check out the bottom left of the image, you can actually see where Jason used bird shit as like a storytelling element. So let's rewind again and look at some of our older work. You'll notice that these splashes share many similarities. Champions are either in what we would call heroic or action poses. Their source of power is prominently being displayed in the image and most oftentimes being used. Uh, we're always seem to be looking up at the champion and their face is unobstructed. I mean, why the hell can we see this dude's face if he's wearing a hood? Uh, and all of their abilities look more or less exactly like what they do in game. Now we made these rules because we thought this was what players wanted. We figured players wanted to pick up and play a champion character model because it was cool and what we would call aspirational, which by the way was like our biggest freaking buzzword. Nobody knew what it meant. <laughs> so let's take a look at Fizz here. Seems like a cool enough looking dude. It's this blue fish thing, all around happy guy. He's gonna poke you with his magic trident. He's got a pet shark. I want a pet shark. Uh, he's looking all heroic in the sunlight where he's got water splashes everywhere, you know. Now Fizz is one of my favorite champions in the game. But what this doesn't show you is exactly the thing that I fell in love with. As a Fizz player, I fell in love with his playful nature. Uh, in the hands of a great player, and no, this is not me saying I'm a great player, Fizz is slippery. He's going to taunt you while he uses his crazy skills to dance around all of your abilities and attacks. He's that little tiny underdog that's got the attitude of a whimsical 10-year-old who has fun in everything that he does. And what he's generally doing is kicking everybody's ass. Now, before I started at Riot, I really admired this splash, and in many ways I still do. The shapes of the drawing, the control of the warms and cools to direct your eye to the character, the general rhythm of how the water splashes interacted with the pose of the character that really create this sense of great motion. The fact that the artist did all of these things without realizing it, you know, just naturally, uh, you know, still irks me to this day. But uh, my question is, looking back at this, why did I have to play the character in order to understand that magic personality? Couldn't I have gotten that just from looking at an image of him? You see, the rules did a great job of helping us uh, you know, make the art look consistent, but ultimately it homogenized it. Uh, the rules were too restrictive, and our players recognized it. Let's compare, uh, compare splashes for a minute. This splash art of Elise's Death Blossom skin and her base champion splash were released on the exact same day. You know, from all of our metrics on what made good splash art, this skin should have rocked the worlds of every one of our players. Look at this. Crazy freaking action pose. She's repelling from the ceiling. She's got spider webs flying at her faces. Um, flower petals, which are the theme of this skin, are everywhere. She's hissing at us, and there's magic on pretty much everything, including coming out of the asses of these spiders. So long story short, when we checked the, the forums, players didn't love it. Now, the reason they didn't love it wasn't because of the art execution of the piece. It was because players were getting tired of the same thing over and over again. I mean, we did a billion of these things, and for the small purpose of being a character select screen, they'd served their purpose. But the funny thing is, is that looking back, players saw a potential in our splashes that we, until that point, just weren't seeing. What players wanted was a fantasy to role play, and what we were giving them were glorified pieces of box art. Now here's Elise's base champion splash. Now, it may feel similar in a lot of ways, but there was one key difference that we really felt was important to get across. You'll notice that she's sitting down. Now, this may seem really small, but in actuality, it was a fundamental shift in our philosophy. There were actual debates asking questions like, if she's sitting down, can she really be aspirational to players? There's our favorite word again. And also, why are we hiding her main gameplay hook, her giant spider behind her? Even into our final days of production, we're getting feedback like this, but ultimately we decided to give it a chance and try it. If it didn't work, we could always go back to our old rules. So what did our players think? They actually freaking loved it. Now what this showed us was that what we thought of as a guide to player resonance, these arbitrary rules could be broken and still work. We realized that we had to dig deeper into what our goal should be. Let's analyze the story here. Elise is a spider queen. Why the heck does a queen have to get her hands dirty in killing us? I mean, sure, she attacks in game, but that's not what's important to her as a character. As a queen, Elise should just be able to sit and wait. We're already dead, we just don't know it yet. At this point, we're beyond saving. Check it out, you can see, if you look in the background, 
you could see evidence of her uh, victims where the spiderlings had gotten a hold of them. Uh, the thing that made her a champion that players wanted to role play was that regal feeling, that sense of assumed power and ability to command her minions at will. So fresh off this idea, we figured that we'd crack the code, and to some degree we were right. We figured the trick was, hey, let's show what's cool about a champion's personality. We can show the things about champions that we couldn't show in game, so we were like halfway there. One of our artists, Josh, helped to level this idea up with this next splash of Kha'Zix, where he focused on the viewer's perspective. What's the scariest thing about being hunted? How about the moment where you just got paralyzed by flying stingers and have to wait helplessly while he tracks you down and finishes off the job? What a cool way of telling the story about what it's like to play against Kha'Zix, we thought. We didn't get a really clear understanding of what the purpose of splash art should be until this guy. Malphite's a rock golem in our game that, when this was being painted, sparked many passionate debates in regard to his scale. Now, funny enough, he's one of the smaller models in our game. Uh, so what the hell are we doing painting him like he's eight stories tall? Uh, this debate forced us to reflect on what a champion's fantasy actually is. We were still focusing on who a player would play as or against, but does the fantasy go even deeper than the game? This led us to our current idea. Models are not champions. They're abstractions of our champions. Players play league like a competitive sport. And in a competitive sport, clarity matters. So the in-game assets are low-poly models, always seen from above, made to represent the idea of a character in a gameplay setting where they can be modified to fit the medium of competitive 5v5 gameplay. The real fantasy is external, an implied world of stories and interaction between these characters, free from the constraints of balanced and readable gameplay. And while we create Malphite in-game to fit inside that gameplay space, Malphite's core thematic of being an un is being an unstoppable force. We need to be able to understand the reason for him being unstoppable. When we see him, we need to immediately understand by looking at those ragdoll helmet bros that are getting dragged along, dragged along that any attempt to harness or constrain this force is an exercise in futility. That's the true fantasy and the core concept that players will seek to role play. Now, in order to understand the fantasy, the team feels it's incredibly important to, play, to know the champions as well as players do. We're constantly playing the game, reading up on the backstory of champions, scouring the internet for guides on what players create. We're up to date on all the league memes and player-made content, and many of us watch programs on a regular basis. Some of us have logged literally thousands of hours of the game, and it's not abnormal for us to play multiple games at work. I don't know if you guys can see clearly, but literally everybody. This is about 1 o'clock in the office, and everybody's playing. This type of passion is what helped the team develop trust, not only internally, but on a company scale as well. We try to assign splashes to the artists that are most passionate about those champions. This gives everybody the confidence that the right decisions are being made for splashes, and the ideas are coming from the imagination of an authentic player. Now every week, the team does a collaborative reviews where we all jump into a room and feedback the absolute crap out of each other's work. And during these reviews for this champion, Cassiopeia, we had some serious reservations about her story. We used to assume that the champion's face was the most important part of the splash, but what if that inhibits the story? Cassiopeia is a half-snake, half-human champion in League that can manipulate poison and freeze any enemy into stone in her cone of vision. And we were working to create a new splash to replace the old one that was no longer meeting our style or quality bars. Our first inclination was to show her doing her death stare. That's her biggest gameplay thematic, and we figured that players that would want to be able to see that to understand her better. And we felt like this was a no-brainer, but Evan, the artist on this, wasn't sold on that idea. When we got to review and he showed us this, we had a few concerns about the lighting basically cutting her face in half. Now, even as a, Evan is a Cassiopeia main which is to say he's played hundreds of games of Cassiopeia. Uh, he talked to us about how the magic moment for Cassiopeia, for a player, actually isn't in the act of killing herself itself. It's in the exhilaration that you get that moment right before. It's the moment when the entire enemy team is walking toward you, completely unaware of the absolute hell that's about to rain down upon them as you hide in a bush or concealed terrain in our game. Like a snake, you wait for the perfect moment to strike and unload every ability you have on them. The story had to be about that moment right before. Now, having the shadow across her face creates the feeling of a doorway half open, 
just before the moment where Cassiopeia would freeze whoever this is with her infamous death stare. Here's an instance where player perception actually helped us shape the fantasy. Shaco was originally released about six years ago with this splash. He's a demon jester in our game that basically fills the fantasy of scary ass clown dude. Now, originally, we looked at him as this creepy assassin who terrorizes his enemies and drives them insane before he kills them. And while he still does that, over the years, players' understanding of this guy changed. He became known as one of the hardest champions to catch, and his guerrilla-style hit-and-run tactics have basically become a signature by which players both love and or hate him. But how can we create a splash where we show a champion, this thing that's supposed to be badass, an aspirational entity to players, running away from a fight? Uh, we worried players would perceive him as a coward. In reality, though, Shaco's core concept is like that orange smoke that he leaves behind. It's all too apparent and antagonizing as hell, but ultimately it's still just smoke. The goal here was to target the feeling of being led down the rabbit hole while being indirectly hunted by the very thing that you were trying to hunt. So for a while, Splash was thought to be a premier image of a champion, a one-stop shop for one single champion to avoid player confusion uh, and the opportunity to show champions in a moment that makes them more powerful than anything else in the IP. So players could aspire to that power. And from a developer standpoint, we assumed the player value was derived from the splash assets themselves, the actual illustrations. We figured players wanted their own singular splash per champion, uh, and the idea of sharing a splash uh, space would lessen their value. Uh, as our mentality around Splash shifted, we realized that instead of being a detriment to the Splash, sometimes the whole could be greater than the sum of its parts. As a cool thematic hook for a skin line, the skins team created a heavy metal rock star line of skins for five champions, and we called them Pentakill. Uh, when our music team set out to release a heavy metal album for players inspired by these skins, the Splash team also set out to create an album cover, as well as update the outdated Splashes for these five skins. As we looked to tell their stories, we realized there wasn't any cool enough stories individually that represented the fantasy of these guys. I mean, these guys are a band. We can't pull them apart and show how they're awesome at the same time. So we showed them taking the stage of this epic demon theater and with particular attention to how players would react to this new combined story. It turns out players didn't mind at all. In fact, the idea of characters existing with the same space was something that many actually liked. And this was all the more evidence that we were looking at this all wrong. Players didn't care about having a unique art asset. They wanted a story they could role play and think about when they were listening to the music or playing the game. Gameplay restrictions often limit what we're capable of doing with our in-game VFX. In a game where there's often dozens of spell effects on screen at any given time, it's important for players to understand what those effects are and who they're being cast on. For competitive gameplay, clarity is key. Take a look at this Kale uh, model here. In game, her ultimate ability, Intervention, creates an impenetrable force field around any ally that makes them invulnerable. Now, what are the only abilities in game that does this? So, in game, we made this ability translucent to show who was being protected. Uh, now, in the past, we took care to represent abilities exactly as they were in game because we didn't want to confuse players. And while making the force field translucent would have been an easy solve to the problem, Suke, the artist on this, felt that we weren't going far enough to con convey such a unique ability. Suke's argument was that a translucent force field has been done many times in many forms of media. And while there's many shields in League of Legends that soak up damage, we needed some way to communicate the scope of this particular ability's power. When Suke brought this image to review, the whole team went freaking nuts. The idea of having a dense liquid gold shroud her in a protective bubble was a great solution that was both unique and also felt impenetrable. So taking a look back at Talon, it's pretty easy to see some of the level ups from old to new. But even now we're doing our best to continue to evolve. When we think about the idea of a vicious but stone cold killer, an assassin uh, who Talon is supposed to be, we imagine this would say it. Look at this guy. Super mysterious with his hood covering his face. Uh, he's leaping off the top of a building in a larger than life action pose. Uh, his blade's coming out of every part of his costume. And this crazy circular rhythm where his cape is flaring out. Uh, that's all alluding to the fact that this guy is about to get freaking owned. Uh, you know, great assassin story, right? So let me pose a different question. Why are we showing the most feared assassin from the scariest place on earth 
right hand to one of the scariest rulers in all of Runeterra, about to kill helmet bro number 5,403. <laughs> Why are we, the viewer, these average dudes, able to even witness this event? How is this showing us why he's a cooler assassin than any other? What, it doesn't show us the depth of his tradecraft or, or the difficulty rating of the types of jobs that he actually takes. Ultimately, this could be any assassin in any story. We feel like we missed the mark here. We like the image, but it's not the best story that could have been told. Sure, it's an assassin story, but it's not one that's unique to Talon. The new Katarina Splash is an example of a better way to tell a unique assassin story. Katarina's thematic hook revolves around repeatedly teleporting to her targets and dispatching them with precision and ease. In her splash, she's featured in a throne room above a red carpet. Gravity still hasn't even taken effect on these dead guards behind her. Uh, and she's already coming out of her next portal at lightning speed about to deliver the final blow to the viewer, a leader or a king, somebody who's worth her time. As we've evolved, we realize the idea shouldn't be to regulate uh, the stories that we're trying to tell in order to create consistency. We should create consistency in other ways, like finding the right aspects of our visual style that to constrain. Things like color with vibrant but limited palettes. These call back to the limited palettes in game. Lighting scenes with colorful lights that bounce all over the place um, with particular attention to color temperature. High polished but handcrafted rendering and strong graphic shapes to our VFX, similar to the way that we depict them in-game, but not constrained by the exact execution. All of these are fantasy agnostic, but they've done a much better job to allow for the individuality required to create a breadth of over 120 unique champions in the game. Like our first image of Scion here, who's such a behemoth that his axe, something that we used to think of as a source of power, has basically become an afterthought. All he needs to do is step on us, as we get to sit and stare through our helmet as we get crushed. While we've spent a lot of time working a level up on craft, I'd argue that that was only a small part of what the team attributes its success to today. It was far more important for us to understand why we create splashes for players. If I could give advice to any and all who make art for games, and especially those who create characters, I'd say really get to know and love the game that you work on and the audience that you work for. Know and love the characters like your players do before you start telling their stories and understand what purpose those stories will serve. It's impossible to tell their stories effectively without first understanding the emotional impact they're supposed to have on your players. And lastly, empower any artist to break any rule in favor of creating unique fantasy for players to role play. More often than not, they're gonna thank you for it. Thanks. All right, so I think we got, do we have time for questions? Yeah? Cool. So I guess I'll jump up to the microphone. Hi. Where am I looking? Oh, hey. Uh, I'm just curious, did you ever, uh, through the process, consider drastically different art styles, like watercolor or any other, just to mix up the, the look of the characters, the impression you give the, the viewer? Yeah, I mean, so, Back in the day, we kind of did have a whole bunch of art styles. With the resources that we had, we were you know, kind of looking for, for any way to depict the champion or, or skin that we could. Um, ultimately, we wanted to create a consistency so that when people looked at, at the art, they knew what game they were gonna be looking at. You know? uh, especially when we're gonna start trying to tell different stories and create different viewpoints and we're not constraining them by the, you know, the stories that we're telling, we need some way of keeping it consistent so that people don't you know, get confused about what they're looking at. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Let me just stand on my tippy toes here. Um, so um, one of the things that's very key for a lot of champions is rivals, like Vi is a rival of Jinx, and Rengar mm -hmm. is a rival of Kha'Zix, and there's a lot of interplay between these two champions, and in a way it makes, it makes players quote unquote hate each other. Not really, not really hate hate, but like it gives you a sense that it's like, okay, I'm playing Vi, they're playing Jinx, I'm gonna beat her head in. So um, have you ever thought about doing a splash art where there's a champion that is fighting another champion. Not so much, you know, I'm beating down the champion, but more so we're two equals fighting. Mm -hmm. So we have considered that, right? With champion splashes, we do wanna be super clear about which champion that you're picking. Um, with skin splashes, we're, we tend to be a little bit more liberable, liberal with the stories that we tell and put multiple champions in the splashes. Um, 
you know, we have splashes where they kind of harken back to each other. If you look at the Jinx versus the Vi, right, they both have the same exact background, the ideas that Jinx kind of busted in later that night where she, you know, like got into the bank and, and blew everything up. Uh, but yeah. Anything um, else? Hi. You were talking about how um, like there's like a team of I think 10 or 12 that you showed that where the splash art is a is a result of all of you working on it. Um, is that um, in that within that process is that a you it, like if someone does one thing and it, like someone works on the face and it passes off to someone else or it passes off to someone else is that the case or is it more of a um, well it is still a result of the whole team is it where maybe only three to five people out of that whole team work on yes. certain splashes or is it a mix of that. Okay, so the question was basically if we're, you know, labeling every splash as part of every person on the team, um, how is that actually, like, uh, done, right? Yeah, how is the work divvied up? Mm -hmm. So uh, the way that we look at it is that because we're giving feedback so regular to each other, uh, it, it really becomes, like, greater than, than what that one person can do. Uh, you know, we're constantly just, like, you know, giving ideas, paint overs, all these things. Um, there was a couple splashes up here that, that you saw, like the Elise Base skin splash. We had five people working on that at the same exact time. It came together in like four days. Uh, but the, uh, you know, we, we've kind of developed a layer, layer style thing where we, you know, we'll send certain layers to one person, certain layers to another person, and then we kind of check back in and merge the files into like a master file. Um, that's, you know, we, we work differently generally. Generally, there's one person working on each splash, but they're getting feedback from the whole team on a regular basis, but we do collaborate a lot. Yeah. Cool. Hey, uh, what elements would you change about the Fizz splash to better portray his kind of playful trickster yeah. nature? I've been thinking about this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, what would we change about the Fizz splash? We're, we're probably going to do it relatively soon, TM. Um, <laughs> but the, you know, I mean, my, my fantasy for that, that splash, like my, my dream, is to have him like freaking on a on a beach, right? This giant tidal wave behind him. Like, imagine if he was like on his like troll pole, where he's kind of doing his like backflip and giving you like the peace sign. But like in the background, you can see like the 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 shark underneath the wave, like in the subsurface. You know, and it's just massive shark coming at you, right? And there's like a little tiny fish that he throws at you, like to mark where the the shark is going to go, like flapping around in front of you. Like that's that's my dream, but it might come out completely different. But, yeah. Thanks. Hi. Hey. Can we expect like any splash art regarding the hidden passives of the characters? Hidden Jim? passives of the characters. Those, uh, I'm not actually sure. Like we, those have kind of become like little, little tiny inside jokes for players, you know, like with Leona and the, the are, you, are you talking about Leona and the, the sunglasses and stuff like that? Yeah, like Rumble and Tristana, that type of thing. Gotcha. Um, so with the Rumble splash, right? We actually, for a little while, on the inside of the, the uh, on the inside of the cockpit, we had like Tristan or Tristy like oh, scratched into the name, you know. Nice. Um, we ultimately took it out because we didn't want it to be like super distracting, but and it was also really hard to read with the you know the values and stuff. We, you know, we we want to do that stuff, but you know it can't be in every splash, you know. A good job, though. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. Uh, hi. Hey. Um, my question is. Well, when creating a champion, there are many possibilities of the personality and the style of the champion. The, that champion can be overly cute or can be over, uh, overly gross. And I noticed that uh, the splash arts are tending to be somehow a lot more darker or with uh, colors that are not that strong. Mm -hmm. uh, how will you foresee the challenges of dealing with a character with very strong colors and style? Uh, when creating these new splash arts for them. I'm sorry, so you're asking about like how we deal with different, maybe not so like badass in your face, I'm gonna kill you champions? Yeah, exactly, especially with the colors and, and the textures. Uh, they, those characters will prefer to look simple uh, while the current art styles are be, very heavy on textures and, and realism light, and the lighting and such. Gotcha. Um, so the way that I would kind of look at that is if you look at, do you guys, are you guys familiar with the NAR splash? We have kind of the, the little dude, uh, you know, his, his, he's got two forms, his big form where he's, you know, big NAR and then the little form where he's like this little like baby yordle thing. Um, and the ways that we're trying to show them are, are kind of in their, their base form and, and uh, kind of show them as players would see them from the beginning, right? 
um, but still kind of allude to a lot of the other things that, that do make them badass. So because of him and, and him not being super cognizant of what he's doing, he's kind of the more primal version of them. Uh, you know, the only way that we can really show that uh, is to, to show him kind of like just totally distracted by like a little firefly, but still sitting in, in like his footprint from when he's like big gnar and have the scratches everywhere and like the shadow with the, the little like lightning bug that alludes to, you know, his big form. So we generally tend to focus on, on kind of the close-ups for those dudes and, and try to figure out the ways that we can sell both ends of their personality through like abstract methods, you know. Thank you. Cool. Sweet. All right. Well, I'll be out and around, so if anybody has any more questions.